What's up? I'm Vin, and today I want to take a look at the June 2023 Algebra 1 Regents. I'll leave a link to a copy of this test in the description below. Now let's get started. So first up, we have the expression 9m squared minus 100 is equivalent to, and it's one of these, we're going to use the difference of two squares formula. Anytime you have something like a squared minus b squared, this factors nicely to a plus b times a minus b. Now I know we're using this here because we have two perfect square terms here, and there's a subtraction sign between them. So what I'm thinking about here, how do I do this quickly in my head, is I'm looking at the first term, 9m squared, and I take the square root of it, and the square root of 9 is 3, the square root of m squared is m. So that would be the square root of the first term, and then we take the square root of 100, and the square root of 100 is 10, since 10 times 10 is 100. So now to factor this, we're doing the square root of the first term, plus or minus the square root of the second term. So that's going to go here. The, the square root of the first term, 9m squared, was 3m, so that's going first in both parentheses. And then we write the square root of the second term. The square root of 100 was 10, and that's going after the plus or minus like this. So now we scan the answer choices, and this is going to match up with choice 1. Now, I know the order isn't exact, but remember, multiplication is commutative, so we could just flip these. So choice 1 is definitely our answer. Question 2, which expression represents an irrational number? So you have to know that an irrational number is an infinite decimal that does not repeat. It has no nice pattern to it. It just goes on and on forever. So I know that this one here, choice 1, is not the answer because the square root of 16 is 4 and the square root of 1 is 1. And 4 plus 1 is equal to 5, and 5 is a whole number, so this is in fact a rational number. This is an integer, but all integers are rational numbers, so this is not the answer. And now this one, we do the square root of 25, which is 5 plus the square root of 4, which is 2, and 5 plus 2 is 7. So we have another whole number here, so this is definitely rational. So this is not our answer. And now we look at this one, the square root of 36 is 6, plus the square root of 7, 7 is not a perfect square. So this tells me this is not going to simplify nicely. Anytime you have the square root of something that is not a perfect square, the square root of a non-perfect square is automatically irrational. So if I have a whole number plus something, uh, if I have a whole number plus something irrational, this is still going to be irrational. So this is going to be our answer choice. But now, just to be safe here, we'll evaluate the last one. The square root of 49 is 7, plus the square root of 9 is 3, and 7 plus 3 is 10. This is a nice whole number, so it is rational. Choice 3 is our answer. Question three, we want to know which linear equation represents a line that passes through the point negative three, negative eight. And one thing that jumps out at me right away with all the answer choices is that the slope of all the answer choices, all of those lines have a slope of two. And the way that I know this is I think of the formula y equals mx plus b. And anytime you have a line that's in this form, y equals mx plus b, the slope is the m value, which is the coefficient of x. And if you look here, you could see that all of the coefficients of x are equal to two. And then b is our y-intercept. So one way of solving for the line would be to take this point x, y, and our slope of 2, and we could plug it into the y equals mx plus b formula to solve for b. So we have y, which is negative 8, equals the slope m is equal to 2, and our x value here is negative 3, so we're going to plug in negative 3, and then we just tack on the plus b in the formula. So now we just have one variable to solve for here, so we have negative 8 equals 2 times negative 3 is negative 6, and then we tack on the plus b, and then to get b by itself, we're going to do plus 6 on both sides because that's the opposite of the minus 6 here. So now this cancels. Negative 8 plus 6 is negative 2. So b is equal to negative 2. So our full equation would be y equals 2x, and then b is minus 2. And that's going to correspond with choice 1. Now, if we want to check our answer here, we could go to the y equals, and we could write in 2x minus 2. So we write in 2x minus 2. And if I want to pull up a table of values, I can press second graph. And I'm going to scroll up to negative 3 here. And notice that our y value here is negative 8. So this one does, in fact, check out. Choice 1 is our answer. Question 4, we have to subtract polynomials, but we have to distribute this negative 3 first. Now, before we actually do that, I want to think of this question over here. If you had to add 123 plus 456, so now you're back in elementary school, you would have to line up the 1's place, the 10's place, and the 100's place. And then you could add. You could do 3 plus 6 is 9. 2 plus 5 is 7, and 1 plus 4 is 5, so your answer would be 579. And now this is very similar, except now you have a, uh, you have a constant term, you have x terms, and you have x squared terms. So we could write, we have 5x squared, we have minus x, and we have plus 4. But now, before I write this stuff underneath, we have to distribute the negative 3 here. So we're going to have to send the negative 3 all the way through. So negative 3 times x squared is minus 3x squared, and notice that I write it in line with the x squared term above it. 
and then we have negative 3 times negative x. That would give us a plus 3x because a negative times a negative is a positive. And then we have negative 3 times negative 2 is positive 6. So now everything is lined up nicely, so just combine the like terms. 4 plus 6 is 10, so I'm going to write plus 10 here. We have negative x plus 3x, and for this you just have to know your integers, that what you're doing here is you're doing negative 1 plus 3, and negative 1 plus 3 is equal to 2. Let's just make that a little bit neater. So we have negative 1 plus 3 is equal to 2, so here we would have plus 2x, and then we have 5x squared minus 3x squared would give us 2x squared. So we just have to make sure we carry down the x squared and the x, and then this would be our solution here. So we scan the answer choices. We have 2x squared plus 2x plus 10, choice 2. Question five, we want to find the 24th term of this sequence here. And this is an arithmetic sequence. And the way that I know this is that to get from one term to the next, all we're doing is subtracting the same thing each time. We're just doing minus six, minus six, minus six, forever and ever and ever for this sequence here. So that means we could go to the reference page here and we have this nice formula. A sub M, the nth term of this sequence, is equal to the first term plus N minus one times d, where d is the common difference. Well, since we're subtracting 6 each time to get from one term to the next, our common difference is going to be negative 6. And then a1 represents the first term of the sequence, and the first term is negative 5. So now we could plug into this formula. We have a sub n is equal to the first term, which is negative 5, plus we'll have n minus 1 times the common difference here is negative 6. So this is our formula. So to find the 24th term, that just corresponds to n equals 24. So we plug into this formula, we have a sub 24. Now remember that 24 is a subscript. Okay, we write that in the small spot over here. And that just means this is the 24th term of the sequence. And this is equal to, we have negative five plus, and now we have n is 24 minus one times negative six. So this we could just do on the main screen. So we could get out of the table from before and we're gonna have negative five plus, and let's pretend we don't know 24 minus one is 23. So now we tack that on, and then we're going to multiply by negative 6. So I put parentheses, negative 6, like this. We press enter, and our solution is negative 143. So this worked out to negative 143, and this is going to match choice 2. Now, another cool way to do this is we could press stat. We could go to edit here, and we could enter in the values right into the table here. And I could say we have so far four terms. We have 1, 2, 3, 4 terms. And if we go over to the L2 column here, we could say the first term was negative 5. And then the second term here was negative 11. And then the third term was negative 17. The fourth term was negative 23. And just know when you have an arithmetic sequence, the terms are changing by the same amount each time. So this behaves as a linear function. So what you could do is you could press stats, go to calculate, and you could calculate a linear regression. So number four. So this will write the equation of the line for you that passes through all those points. And notice what we have here, our A value in front of X is negative six, our B value is one. So this writes it in the form MX plus B for you. So you could say Y equals, we clear this out, we have negative six X plus one. So this is just an alternate way, but it's a nice way to do multiple choice questions. So we press second graph to go to the table and then check it out. Notice that our first term is negative five, our second term is negative 11, and we could just scroll down here to 24 and see that our 24th term is in fact negative 143. So that's just the second way of doing this, but it's nice because it tells us our answer is definitely correct. Question six, when completing the square for this quadratic equation, which equation is a correct step in the process? So for this question here, we should know the technique for completing the square. So what I like to do for questions like this is I take the original equation like this, and what I'm gonna do first is subtract 77 on both sides. So I'm gonna have instead, after 77 minus 77 cancels, we're gonna have x squared minus 18x, and I'm gonna leave a space, is equal to negative 77. Now, completing the square, the way that it works is you focus on the b term. So the b term here is negative 18. So we're gonna take the b term, we're gonna cut it in half, so we have negative 18, we cut it in half by dividing by two, and then we square it. So if we work this out, negative 18 over two is negative nine, and negative nine squared is 81. And this is the number we wanna to add to both sides. This is the process of completing the square. Now, why is it called completing the square? Is because now on the left side, what we have is we have a perfect square trinomial. Because remember, when you wanna factor something like this, you need two numbers that have a sum of negative 18, and the two numbers also have to have a product of 81. So if we continue that thought here, what two numbers have a sum of negative 18 and a product of 81? It would be negative nine and negative nine. If I did negative nine plus negative nine, that would be negative 18. And if I multiply them, negative nine times negative nine is positive 81. 
So that matches what we need. So that helps us factor this. This would factor nicely now to x minus 9 times x minus 9. So we have matching factors here. That's what makes it a perfect square trinomial is that the factors are identical. So now we have negative 77 plus 81 is 4. And now when you multiply something by itself, you could use the exponent here. You could call this x minus 9 squared is equal to 4. And now we scan the answer choices. This matches choice 1. Question 7, which function will have the greatest value when x is greater than 1? So right away, just looking at this, I see that we only have one exponential function. And the base of the exponential function is greater than 1. The base here is 5. So right away, I could see that this one wins. So a big concept that you want to carry with you is that exponential functions, so I'll even write it out, exponential functions increase at a faster rate than power functions. Now, what I mean by this between power functions and exponential functions is something like 2 to the x versus x to the second. If your variable is in the exponent spot, and once again, your base is greater than 1, this is going to win the battle versus x squared. Even if it was 2 to the x versus x to the uh, x to the 100 power like this, 2 to the x is still going to win eventually. x to the 100 is going to win in the beginning, but you give this enough time and it's going to pass this one up. So just remember this idea. Exponential functions increase at a faster rate than power functions. So that's how I know it's choice one right away. But if you want to be 100% sure, you could just type all of these into the y equals spot. Now, once again, we're claiming that choice one is the answer. So that's going to be the graph in blue here. So if we press graph, notice that the blue graph here is increasing faster than the others because it's climbing before the others climb above the window here. And if I really wanted to be sure, I could press second graph and look at the table. And if we scroll over here, you could see that let's go back towards uh, back towards zero here. So let's go ahead and scroll that. If we look towards the beginning here, you could see that it's 10, 7, 7, 7 like this. But then as time goes on, the blue one gets to 50. And then the pink one here is the, is the second place winner here is at 21. But the blue column here quickly surpasses all the other columns. Question five, we have Mike using the equation B equals 1300 times 2.65 to the X to determine the growth of bacteria in a laboratory setting. And the exponent represents, and then we have all these answer choices here. So we'll go through them one by one. The total number of bacteria currently present would refer to the B term here. So this is not our answer here because once again, the exponent that we're looking at, the exponent refers to this piece, the X. So now we move on to choice two, the percent at which the bacteria are growing. That's referring to the base of the exponent, okay? That tells you how fast things are gonna change. The base of the exponent is the determining factor here. So that's why this one is out because once again, the base determines that information. The initial amount of bacteria is 1300. Okay, so a good formula to just have on the side here is that the amount is equal to P times one plus R to the T power. When you have this formula here, this is for compound interest. It also applies to exponential growth of bacteria. So this is like the initial amount. R is the rate of growth. So this is the rate of growth. And then T is the period of time. So that means, once again, this one is out because the coefficient of the exponent term here tells you the initial amount. And then we have the number of time periods. Yes, the exponent here is how much time goes by. So that's how I know choice four is our answer. Question nine, a company ships an average of 30,000 items each week. And the approximate number of items shipped each minute is calculated using the conversion. So what I'm thinking about here is what units are we starting with? And what units do we want to wind up with? So we have 30,000 items per week. And we want this to change to items per minute. Okay, so items per minute is the target. So now we go through these answer choices. And I can see right away that choice one is no good. Because notice here that if you were to do week times week, so that's what I'm thinking about. If I did week times week in the denominator, this would work out to week squared. Okay, so I know this is a ridiculous thing to say, but that's what would happen if you multiply weeks times weeks. It would be square weeks, which doesn't make sense. What we need to happen is units to cancel so we convert to items per minute. So now we look at the next answer choice. Notice we have week over week. That would cancel out. Okay, it's kind of like the idea that if you had five divided by five, these are matching factors. They cancel and it simplifies to one. So that's the idea that you need matching factors on top and bottom. So weeks cancel out, days cancel out. And then hours cancel out like this. And notice what we're left with. We're left with items per minute, which is what we wanted. So I know right away this is the correct answer. But let's just be sure that the other answers are wrong. So here, once again, notice we have weeks 
times weeks, which is once again, square weeks. So that's gonna be out. And now we look at this answer choice. We have week over week cancels. We have days over days canceling. And then we have hours over hours canceling. And what are we left with here? The units that we would be left with is we have some value here. So we have some number, but we have minutes per item. So we have minutes per item. But remember what the goal was. This one is a good answer, but it's just that little bit wrong. The, the target was to get items per minute, but this would give us minutes per item. So this one just comes out flipped. We want it to be like it would turn out in choice two. So this is definitely our answer. Question 10, we have a function graph below and we wanna find a possible equation for this function. Now, one of the ideas that's gonna be very helpful is that factors and roots have an opposite relationship. Now, what I mean by that, if we look at this graph, notice that we have roots, so we'll find the roots here. We're gonna have roots at x equals negative one, two, three. So we have a root at x equals negative three. And then we also have a root at x equals positive two. And I know that these are gonna be the only roots because this graph has arrows at the end. So this graph is just gonna drop forever. And then in this direction, it's just gonna go up forever like this. So what I mean by the factors and roots have an opposite relationship is that if the roots are x equals negative three and x equals positive two, then the corresponding factored form would be x plus three. Because if I were to set x plus three equal to zero, if I wanna find the root from the factor x plus three, to solve for x, I would just subtract three on both sides and that would give me x equals negative three. So I use this little shortcut here to help me build a potential, uh, to build a potential function. So x equals negative two would come from this factor. But now we gotta be careful. We might just look at this and say, oh cool, the answer has to be choice two. But no, this is a very dangerous bear trap, okay? What we should be noticing here is that this is not a quadratic function. Choices one and two are out because you see how they just have x plus two times x minus three, x minus two times x plus three. There's only two factors with an x. So when you multiply the x times the x, the most you're gonna get out of this is x squared. But notice an x squared graph would be smiling at you like this. It would look like this. It wouldn't make two turns like this. So that's how I know that choices one and two are out. So now it's between these choices. And right away I could see that it's choice three because we have an extra factor here of x minus 12. And if you set x minus 12 equal to zero, this would tell us that we have a third root at x equals 12. Now, an extra detail here, why is this thing squared? So why do we have a square attached? And it has to do with the fact that this graph does not go through the x-axis at x equals two. It's tangent is the word, it touches the x-axis at x equals two. So another big idea is that if your graph is tangent to the root, it doesn't go through the x-axis, there's gonna be an even power attached to your factor. But remember, for this test, we do get to bring a calculator, so we should check our answer. So let's clear this out and type in the f of x that we found. So now we press graph, moment of truth here. Now, if we wanna see more of the graph here, notice that this goes way up. I'm gonna extend the window. So I'm gonna to go to the window here and I'm gonna make the y maximum for now. I'll switch it to 20. So I'm just gonna make the graph taller. And now we could determine, does this look like what we have here? It does, we have a root at negative three and we have a root at two, but notice the graph is tangent to the x-axis at two. So our answer choice here definitely checks out. Question 11, we have a function g of x and we wanna find g of negative four. So for this one, we could do it by hand, but we do get to bring a calculator to the test. So if we wanna be 100% sure, we could write in, we have negative x squared, and then we have minus x, and then we have plus five. And our goal is to find the function value at negative four. So if we press second graph here and go to the table, we could scroll up to negative four and see that the function value is gonna be negative seven. So our solution is g of negative four equals negative seven, and this matches up with choice two. Now, if we wanna do this by hand, I like to leave all of the x's out. And on the right side, I replace the x's with a blank pair of parentheses. So I have this expression here. So if I wanna find this by hand, I'm gonna write a negative four inside each parenthesis like this. So this would be g of negative four. And then for this, we have to know order of operations. And the reason I'm emphasizing this is that the part that most students mess up when they do mess up is this first part. So we have to do parentheses exponents first. The most common mistake is people say, oh, negative four squared is 16 and they start off with positive 16 and they leave out this negative in front. But what we have to do first is we're doing negative four squared. And if we just do that separately, negative four squared on its own is equal to 16. But notice there's an extra minus in front. So if I put an extra minus in front, I'm gonna put an extra minus in front on both sides. So this actually starts out as minus 16 and then minus minus four changes to plus four and then we have plus five. So now I just go from left to right. I'm gonna have negative 16 plus four is negative 12. So I have negative 12 plus five 
which is negative seven. So we still get choice two. Question 12, we have a movie theater popcorn box. It's in the shape of a rectangular prism and the base is six by four and the height is eight inches. So the first thing I'll do is just draw this thing out. So there's the popcorn box. So we have a box of popcorn and it's six by four. So I'll put the four here and the six here since I drew this longer and the height is eight. Now I left the units out because on the algebra regions, even the geometry and algebra two regions, you don't lose points for not writing units, but just know you should still learn it because when you get to science classes like physics, you will lose points if you don't know how to write units out. So this is the original box. And then they're telling us they're gonna create a larger box that the length and width will be increased by x inches so the new box here if we redraw this thing and not necessarily drawn to scale but here's the new box okay so there's the new box they're telling us that they increased the length and width by x inches so that means that the bottom part here we're going to add an x to each of those we're increasing it by x so that tells you to add so we have four plus x six plus x but be careful this part a lot of people might miss the height remains the same so the height is staying as eight like this so which function represents the volume V of X of the larger box? Well, just know the volume of a rectangular prism is length times width times height. So the volume, if we write it as a function, is going to be equal to, we're going to have 4 plus X times, we could show by using parentheses, 6 plus X, and then times the height, which is equal to 8. So now we look at the answer choices here. 3 and 4 are automatically out because they did length plus width plus height. And then let's see here, choice one is very depressing because for this one, the student just didn't read this part carefully here. The height remains the same. For this one, they increased the height by X as well, but the height had to remain the same. So we're gonna go with choice two. Question 13, the expression here is equivalent to one of these expressions. And right away, I could see that it's choice one because I'm using this rule. We have A to the B times A to the C is A to the B plus C. So if we were to expand choice one, we would have 300 times four, and then we would add these exponents because notice we have four to the X times four to the third. So we would have four to the X plus three, which would match what we have originally here. This one is no good because if we use this rule, when we have A to the B to the C power, an exponent to an exponent, you can multiply like this. So this would actually be 300 times four to the X times three or to the three X power like this. So that's why this one's no good. This one is no good because we would just factor out a 300 and we would have four to the X plus four to the third and four to the x plus four to the third does not combine to four to the x plus three so it doesn't work like that for this one and then this one here they just took the x and they moved it to the 300 you can't just move exponents wherever you want like that so four is out one is definitely our answer question 14 ashley only has seven quarters and some dimes in her purse she needs at least three dollars to pay for lunch which inequality could be used to determine the number of dimes d she needs in her purse to be able to pay for lunch. Okay, so for this question here, know that she has exactly seven quarters. So there's no variable attached to the quarters. So we could just say seven times 25 cents. And that'll tell us how much money that Ashley has in quarters. But how much money she has in dimes, D is a variable. So we're gonna multiply the value of a dime is 10 cents. So we could write that as 0 0.10. And we're gonna multiply that by D where D is the number of dimes that Ashley has. But she needs at least $3 to pay for lunch. So now we just have to think about this part. So are we gonna put a less than or equal to or a greater than or equal to here? Well, if she needs at least $3 to pay, for, to pay for lunch, this is how much money she has. So her money has to be greater than or equal to $3 because if you think about it, if she showed up to the register and she needs at least $3 but she has less than $3, they're not gonna give her the food. So she needs greater than or equal to. Her money has to be greater than or equal to $3 in order for her to be able to buy the food. So now we look at this and seven times 0 0.25, if we look at every answer choice, I'm gonna say here that's 1.75, but you could check that in a calculator. Or if you just know that seven quarters is $1.75, you could also use that idea as well. So this is what we're looking for in the answer key here. So 1.75 plus 0 0.10 is greater than or equal to three matches this choice here. Now, if we look at these answer choices, the reason why the others are no good is that this one here, they didn't multiply by the value of the dime. So that's why one is no good. If we look at choice three, once again, they didn't multiply by the value of the dime here. So this is no good. And also it has a less than or equal to, which is no good. Four is like almost good. They multiplied by the value of the dime here. But once again, less than or equal to is no good because if she shows up with less than $3, 
This is her total money. If she shows up with less than $3, she's not going to be able to buy the lunch. So choice two is definitely our answer. Question 15, we have the formula for the area of a trapezoid, and then we have the height h of the trapezoid may be expressed as. So for this question here, we want to take this equation and solve for h. Now, what makes this topic a little bit tricky is that when you do the algebra, nothing is going to actually cancel out. It's just going to move from one side to the other. So that's what makes these questions a little bit tricky. But what I'm thinking about here, once again, is we want to get the h term by itself. So I think about how could I get rid of some of this stuff? Well, the one half I could get rid of if I multiply both sides by two. Because if I do one half times two, everything here is attached by multiplication. So the order doesn't matter. I could do one half times two, which is equal to one. So these terms here just cancel out nicely. So now I have two times a is two a. And this is equal to we have b1 plus b2 times h. So now here, the goal, once again, is to solve for h. So how do I get rid of this b1 plus b2 in parentheses? These are attached by multiplication. So I could divide by this factor, b1 plus b2. And I'm going to do that on both sides like this. So I have b1 plus b2. On the right side, I could write it in parentheses like this. So it looks like it matches what we have on top. But the parentheses aren't necessary. What does happen, though, is that the b1 plus b2 cancels out on top and bottom. And now we have h equals 2a over b1 plus b2. Choice 4 is our answer. Question 16, we have f of x is absolute value x, and it's multiplied by k to create g of x, which is k times absolute value x. Which statement is true about the graphs of f and g if k equals a half? Well, the first thing I would do here is write g of x equals, and instead of k, we could plug in 1 half. So we have 1 half times absolute value x. So these are the two functions we want to compare. Now, if you just know how to do this, like absolute value x, it looks like this. It's in the shape of a v. And the lines here cut quadrants 1 and 2 at 45 degrees. So it looks like this. This is our graph of f of x. So what happens when I multiply this function by 1 half? It's going to make it wider. It's going to make it go out like this. So g of x would look something like this. I'll just draw that a little bit neater. So g of x, and I'm going to try one more time, is going to look something like this. So this would be the graph of g of x. So how would you describe this in words? This is going to make the graph wider. So g of x is wider than f of x. Now, if you want to be 100% sure here, you can just go to the graph, you press Y equals, and you're going to type in absolute value X. So you press math, you go to number, and then ABS stands for absolute value. So you write your absolute value X, and then G of X was one half absolute value X. One half, I could just call 0 0.5. And then I have math, I go to the right to absolute value, and I type in my absolute value of X. So let's compare the blue and the red. The red graph is definitely wider than the blue graph. The one half makes it stretch out. If I had replaced it with, let's say, something like two, so let's say k was equal to two, that would make it more narrow, okay? That would make it go to the y-axis faster. So when you multiply by a positive constant that's greater than one, it makes it narrow. When your positive constant is between zero and one, it's gonna make it wider. Question 17, we have adults being surveyed and we wanna see if they like SUVs or sports cars. And here's the result of the survey. And then we have here, of the number of adults that preferred sports cars, approximately what percent were males? Now the highlighted stuff is very important because we're only considering the adults that prefer sports cars. So that tells us we're only focusing on this column here. So since we're trying to find a percent now, the concept behind percents is to consider the part over the whole. So out of the people that prefer sports cars, what percent are males? Well, the part here is the males. There are 38 males out of the total amount of people that like sports cars is 84. So now we just do 38 divided by 84, and we get this decimal here. Now, when you want to convert this decimal to a percent, you could just multiply it by 100. And we could see here that our answer is going to be 45.2 choice two. Now, one thing to be careful of, some people might look at this and say, okay, 38 males, but they might say, oh, the total total is 240 and they divide like this. But be careful. This is a very dangerous bear trap. There is, of course, going to be an answer waiting for you, but you have to make sure you do 38 out of the total people that like sports cars. So this worked out to approximately 45.2% and this matches choice two. So question 18, we'll give ourselves space. We have 2x squared equals 72. And there's a few ways we could solve for x here. One way would be to divide both sides by two. And then this cancels out here. We have x squared equals 72 divided by two is 36. And then we could say the square root of x squared is x and equals six. So choice three. 
No, this is a very, 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 very dangerous bear trap, okay? This is what they're expecting you to do, and there's always going to be an answer choice waiting, but it's actually choice four. And the reason being is that when you take the square root of x squared, it is not equal to x. It is equal to the absolute value of x, which is equal to plus or minus x, okay? So this square root property, you need to know this one, okay? Because they're expecting you to do something like this. You would have to say x is equal to plus or minus 6 like this and you would get choice four if you want to avoid that issue altogether when you get to the step where you have x squared equals 36 what you could do is subtract 36 on both sides and then from here you're going to have x squared minus 36 is equal to zero and then you could use that difference of two squares formula we talked about before you could factor this as x plus six times x minus six and this is now equal to zero and then you set each factor equal to zero you have x plus six equals zero that gives you x equals negative six and then you have x minus 6 is equal to 0, which would give you a solution of x equals positive 6. So there are your two solutions for x. You have x equals plus or minus 6. Question 19, we have three quadratic functions next to each Roman numeral. And we want to know which of these functions have the same vertex. So for the first one, Roman numeral 1, we need to know this formula. We need to know y equals a times x minus h squared plus k. This is the vertex form of a quadratic equation here. And if we want to find the vertex, the vertex is in the form hk. So we're just going to write that out. We have the vertex is h comma k like this. To go from here to here, notice there's a minus in front of the h. So this will trip some people up here. You just have to make sure that you flip the sign when you're identifying the vertex. So you're going to flip the sign here. And then to go from here to here, you're going to keep the sign the same. So here you just keep the sign. Okay, so when you're identifying the h, which is the x of the vertex, you flip the sign, but for the K, you keep it the same. So here I would say the vertex for Roman numeral one, just looking at this, is going to be, notice we have a plus two. We have to flip the sign. We get negative two. And then this is our K term here. We're going to keep the sign here. We're going to keep it as just plus five. So we have a vertex of negative two, five. So now looking at Roman numeral two, I could see here that this is in table form. And notice here that we have matching Y values. So the vertex is going to be between negative 1 and negative 2. So the vertex is going to occur at negative 1.5. And then the y value here is still a mystery. But I know it's going to be something a little bit more than 5, because notice we're increasing. We go from negative 3 up to 2. Then we go up to 5. And that means we're going to go up a little bit more. And then we're going to turn and begin our descent here. So whatever this is, it doesn't matter, because notice the x values don't match. So I know that it's not these two together. And now I'm going to look at Roman numeral three and notice the vertex occurs at a nice point here. It occurs at negative two and then we're going up one, two, three, four, five. So this one, we have a vertex of negative two, five. So I can see right away that Roman numeral one and Roman numeral three are the match. And this one here is going to match up with choice three. Question 20, we want to find the domain of f of x. And the domain refers to the possible x values that we could use for f of x. But I noticed right away, f of x is a quadratic function. So what I'm imagining right away is that this is a parabola and it's a smiling parabola because there's a positive one in front of the x squared here. So what are the possible x values we could use? Right away, I'm saying all real numbers because I could go all the way to the left and this thing will keep climbing and I could go all the way to the right and this thing will keep climbing. So I could go forever in both directions. So I could go from negative infinity to infinity. So now let's explore this a little bit more. We have y equals, and we'll type in our function f of x. We're going to have x squared and then plus x and minus 12. And I want our graph to go back to normal, so I'll press zoom 6 because before we were messing with the window settings. But notice we don't see the entire vertex here. This goes down a little bit more. So if I want to see the entire thing, I could go to window. And let me try dropping this down to negative 20. So that way we could see more of the y-axis. And now we could see the turning point here. But our solution, once again, the domain, we're going from negative infinity to infinity because the graph has well-defined values if we go all the way left, all the way right. So why are these answer choices no good? Well, negative infinity to negative four, they're stopping here at negative four, one of the roots. But if we go to the right of negative four, you see we still have graph to follow. That's why this is no good. Choice three is no good because between negative four and three, the graph goes negative, but we still have graph if we go to the right of three or if we go to the left of negative four. So that one's no good. And four is no good because they're saying that the function is only defined from three to infinity. But you see, we have this whole portion of the graph in the section that's less than three. So two is definitely our solution. Question 21, we have a father makes a deal with his son regarding his weekly allowance. The first year he agrees to pay his son a weekly allowance of $10. Every subsequent year, so that means every year after, the allowance is recalculated, 
by doubling the previous year's weekly allowance and then subtracting eight, okay? So the order here is very important. Which recursive formula, so this is also very important, which recursive formula could be used to calculate the son's weekly allowance in future years? Well, right away, I could cross out this answer choice one and answer choice two because these are not recursive. Recursive is when you're using the terms before. So that means you need a first term to start with or at least one starting term. You could have two starting terms or three starting terms or more. But then your formula a sub n or a sub n plus one is defined by the term before. So what I'm imagining here is we have a one and then we have a two in our sequence like this. So by the time we get to the neighborhood of a sub n, we have, let's say, a sub n minus one, a sub n. And then after a sub n, we would have a sub n plus one and so on like this. So here, notice if we have a formula in terms of a sub n plus one, a sub n is the term right before it. So three and four are definitely recursive, but which one here is correct? Well, this is the part we have to pay most attention to, that the way it's calculated is we're going to double the previous year's allowance and then subtract eight. So you see how this would have to be choice three then because two times a sub n, this is the previous year's allowance, okay? So this is the previous year's allowance and then we're subtracting eight, okay? So previous year's allowance, and then you subtract eight. The reason why four is no good is what they're doing is they're subtracting eight first, okay? So they subtract, I'll abbreviate, they subtract eight first, okay, and then double. So if the language of the question changed to, hey, I'm gonna subtract $8 from your allowance and then I'm gonna double it, then choice four would be correct, but this one is the correct one. We double the previous year's allowance and then subtract eight, so choice three. Question 22, we want to know what is the solution to the inequality below? And for this one, we just have to know how to do the algebra. So we have 4 minus 2 fifths x is greater than or equal to, and then we have 1 third x plus 15. So there's a few ways we could start this, but one way would be to subtract 4 on both sides, because my goal is to get the constants on the right and the x terms on the left. So 4 minus 4 cancels. We have negative 2 fifths x is now greater than or equal to, we have 1 third x, and then 15 minus 4 is 11. So now I would move the one third x to the other side by subtracting. So I have minus one third x on both sides. Now for this part here, we could use a calculator. So if I wanna combine these terms, I'm doing negative two fifths and I'm subtracting one third. So I'm gonna do minus one divided by three like this. And I get this decimal, but if I wanna write this as a fraction, I press math, enter, enter, and our coefficient's gonna be negative 11 over 15. So this simplifies to negative 11 over 15 times x is greater than or equal to, and now we're left with just 11. Now, if you wanna see how to do this by hand, when I'm doing negative two fifths minus one third, what I'm doing here is I have to find common denominators. So this I would multiply by three over three, and the second fraction I would multiply by five over five. And then that would give us, we would have negative six over 15 minus five over 15. And that's how this one here simplifies to negative 11 over 15, because we have negative six minus five, which is negative 11. So that's how that one's simplifying. And now to solve for x, we're dividing both sides by negative 11 over 15 like this. But one thing to be very careful of here is that we just divided by a negative on both sides. So that means the inequality is now going to flip to less than or equal to, okay? So just know anytime you multiply or divide an inequality by a negative, the sign flips. And now we're doing 11 divided by negative 11 over 15. So once again, we could use the calculator here. We're gonna press alpha y equals enter to pull up a blank fraction. And this is just to make sure that we're neat. So we have 11 and we're dividing by negative 11 over 15. So we're dividing here and this is gonna work out to negative 15. So we have x is less than or equal to negative 15. And this is gonna match up with choice three. Now real quick, if you wanna see how to do this one by hand, when you're doing 11 divided by negative 11 over 15. So I'll just write that off to the side. We'll write that over here. So when we're doing 11 divided by negative 11 over 15, what we're doing is we're using the technique keep change flip. So I keep the 11 on top. I change the operation to multiplication. And then I flip this to 15 over negative 11. And now 11 over 11 cancels. And now the minus doesn't just disappear. This is like we have a minus one on bottom now. 15 divided by minus one is negative 15. So that's where that minus 15 is coming from. But either way, we're getting choice three. So question 23, I'll just make some space for us here. So let's look at this question now. We have question 23, which statement is correct about this polynomial here? So we just have to know the vocabulary here. The degree of a polynomial is the highest power that appears. So notice here that this is a second degree. So this is a second degree 
polynomial. So choices one and two are out because they're saying it's a third degree polynomial, but they're confusing that with the coefficient of the leading term here. So we have a second degree polynomial. So it's either gonna be choices you know, three or four, and then we have a constant term of two, but the constant term is negative two. So this one is out. And then this one is correct. We have a second degree polynomial with a leading coefficient of three. So the leading coefficient is the coefficient of the highest power of X. So here, that's why we have a leading coefficient of three because the highest power of X is X squared and the number in front is three. Question 24, our last multiple choice question. We have a store manager is trying to determine if they should continue to sell a particular brand of nails. To model their profit, they use the function P of N where N is the number of boxes of these nails sold in a day. A reasonable domain for this function would be. So the domain here is referring to the N term here. And the N term is the number of boxes. So I'll abbreviate here. We have the number of boxes. So this is our domain. And the range here would be the profit. That would be P of N. So what is an appropriate domain here? Well, let's think about it. Non-negative integers. This one is automatically sounding good because just no non-negative integers would be referring to, so choice one, non-negative integers, that's zero, one, two, three, four, and so on like this, because they're only going to sell a whole number of boxes. They're not gonna sell part of a box of nails. They're selling the entire box of nails. Rational numbers is no good because imagine you walk into the store and you go to the manager and say, hey, I would like 11 over 507 I would like this fraction of a box of nails. They would just look at you like you're crazy. You would never ask for that specific amount of nails. That's just kind of impossible to cut into that. That would take you forever. So this one here is out. Real numbers, you could say, all right, how many boxes of nails do you want? Well, give me this many boxes of nails. Give me this many boxes and I'll be so happy. They would just say, yeah, you're crazy. That's, that's just not reasonable here. So this one is out. And integers is almost good, but it's not quite good because integers... Not only do you have zero, one, two, three, and so on like this, this you could also say negative one, negative two, negative three, like this. So no one would walk into a store and say, give me negative five boxes of nails. That would mean they would show up and start handing the manager boxes of nails. That just doesn't make sense either. All right, this is a reasonable answer, but it's not careful to consider that the negative numbers here does not make sense in the context of the question. So choice one is our best answer.